And so uh, I'm going to talk about mammals uh, because, uh, there we go, uh, because I followed up my dinosaur book with a book on mammals. And that's the cover in Britain, but it's just been published this week by my good friends at Ciela here in Bulgaria and is out there uh, for sale. And you can see it as a, you know, a Bulgarian cover, a Bulgarian translation. Now I'm super excited to have the book out here and I look forward afterwards to meeting a lot of you guys and signing books. Anybody who has a book, of course, I'm very happy to sign it and to talk further. Okay, so. I want to tell you the story of mammals, which really is our story because we are a type of mammal. So this is our deepest history, our origin story, where humans came from. I think there's a, an idea that we still see a lot in books and in TV shows that the dinosaurs ruled the world, the asteroid came down, the dinosaurs died, and then the mammals evolved to take the place of the dinosaurs. And that story is kind of true. The asteroid did knock off the dinosaurs. The mammals did take over from the dinosaurs, but the mammals took over from the dinosaurs because they were able to survive the asteroid. They were already there. There were already lots of mammals living with dinosaurs. We had ancestors that stared down that asteroid. And I want to give you the story today of those ancient ancestors, how they changed over time, how they lived with the dinosaurs, how they survived the asteroid, how they led to the 6,000 plus species of mammals today. So I'm going to be telling a story that uh, is about 350 million years long, and I'm going to do that in you know, 45 minutes or so. So rather than waffle on, I want you to envision the world about 350 million years ago. This was the time when all of the world's land was starting to come together, and a lot of Europe, including here, was very close to the equator. It was hot, it was humid, and a lot of Europe looked like this. And so much of the coal that is mined in Europe, in Britain, in America, comes from this time interval, when these giant trees, the first real jungles in the entire history of the earth, these big swamps, the coal swamps, were in existence. And this was a time not only of dense forests that went 30 meters into the sky, but a time when those trees were pumping out so much oxygen that you had huge animals, you had dragonflies the size of pigeons, you had millipedes the size of humans. This was a time of freakish creatures, this coal age, more than 300 million years ago. But there were other animals living there too. Smaller things, more humble things, living in the leaves and in the, in the ferns including things like Archaeophyrus here. It looks like maybe a little lizard, and it was quite small. You could hold it in the palm of your hand. But this little animal living in those coal swamps, trying to avoid those enormous dragonflies and millipedes, is really important because it was a pioneer. And it is the oldest known member of a new group of animals that evolved in those coal swamps, a group that we call the synapsids. And the synapsids are set apart because behind their eye, they have a single hole in their head. So here is their eye, the nose is up there, so there's the eye, and there's this extra hole behind the eye. That hole held jaw muscles. So it allowed them to have bigger, stronger muscles for closing their jaws and eating food compared to their ancestors. Now, we have the very same condition. If you feel your cheekbone, you know, your eye is in front, but you feel the side, there's kind of a hole in there, there is a lot of muscle in there, that is the same hole behind the eye. It's just kind of merged with the eye. That's because we are a synapsid. We are a descendant of those very first little synapsids living in the coal forest. And in fact, all mammals are. It was those first synapsids evolving that extra hole in their head to bite stronger that were the forebearers of the entire history of mammals. And in the coal swamp times, a lot of new species were evolving. And the great family tree of life, it diverged into two 
major families, two major groups. One of those groups led to reptiles and birds and dinosaurs. This is what we call the diapsids. They actually developed two holes behind their eye socket for their jaw muscles. And then the other side developed that single hole. They led to mammals, but true mammals would not evolve for another hundred million years or so, give or take. But during that time, there were a whole bunch of what we call primitive synapsids, the ancestors of mammals, the animals that were developing one by one the features that would eventually make mammals unique, many of the features that we still have in our bodies. Now, as the Carboniferous period, the Coal Age, turned into, there we go, the next interval of time, the Permian period, all of that land came together to form the supercontinent of Pangaea. And on that supercontinent, the animals that reigned supreme, the biggest meat eaters, the biggest plant eaters, the ones at the top of the food chain, were some of these early synapsids. And the most famous of these is Dimetrodon. Now, maybe some of you have seen this animal before. It's often mistaken as a dinosaur. You see it a lot of times in the dinosaur toy sets or on dinosaur posters. We got it into the new Jurassic World film, by the way. It was in Jurassic World Dominion, but it's not a dinosaur. I know it kind of looks like a dinosaur. It kind of looks old and scary and reptilian with big, sharp teeth and claws, but it's not a dinosaur. It is actually a synapsid. It is actually a forebearer of ours. It is more closely related to us than to any dinosaur. And these synapsids ruled Pangaea. They had dominion on that supercontinent. But then, something happened. About 250 million years ago, these enormous volcanoes started to erupt in what is now Russia. These volcanoes were completely unlike any volcanoes humans have ever witnessed, thankfully. For hundreds of thousands of years, maybe even millions of years, these holes opened up in the earth, Grand Canyon-sized fissures in the earth that gushed out tsunamis of lava. And that lava covered a lot of the land. But the biggest problem was that as that lava came up through the earth, it burnt through the crust. And as it burned through the dirt and the rocks, it released carbon dioxide and methane these very potent greenhouse gases which led to global warming. And that global warming was so severe that it caused an extinction, and not just any extinction, but the biggest extinction ever. Up to 95% of all species died. It was the closest life has ever come to completely dying out ever since the first life forms evolved as bacteria four billion years ago. But, but there were some survivors. And among the few survivors were some of the synapsids. Most of the synapsids died. The big ones like Dimetrodon, the big meat eaters and plant eaters, they died. But one type of synapsid in particular made it through. A smaller type of synapsid. One that had some hair on its body to help keep warm. One that could dig burrows to hide away from the climate change. One that had a bigger brain than the other synapsids. And that's these types of synapsids, things we call cynodonts. And that's just a fancy name for the immediate ancestors of mammals. And it was these cynodonts that survived the volcanoes, that made it through into the next interval of time, which is the Triassic period. Now in the Triassic, the supercontinent was still there. There was one giant slab of land from the North Pole to the South Pole, surrounded by one global ocean. And just imagine that you are one of those surviving cynodonts. 95% of other species are dead. The world is almost empty, but you have survived, and now you can make this world your own. Sounds easy, right? <laughs> but there was one problem, one big problem, and that is that a few reptiles survived Two. And those reptiles that survived the volcanoes became the dinosaurs. And it was in the Triassic period that the first true dinosaurs and the first true mammals both originated and started their story. 
So the origin story of dinosaurs and true mammals is the same. They go back to the same time and place, the supercontinent of Pangaea, after that extinction in the Triassic period. Now, their fates would be different, vastly different. The dinosaurs were destined for grandeur. They got bigger and bigger. Some of them became bigger than jet airplanes. Some of them were heavier than the Ryanair plane I was on yesterday, which is unfathomable. These were real animals that got that big. And you can find bones of some of those giant long-necked dinosaurs here in Bulgaria that the team here has found. So dinosaurs went big, mammals did the opposite. They went small. And the dinosaurs really kept the mammals small. But in becoming small, the mammals, they seized their opportunity to thrive at small size. And the very first mammals were things that looked like this, the first true mammals. And I keep saying that, true mammals. What defines a mammal relative to their ancestors are a few changes in their skeleton and in their behavior. And the biggest one of all is that true mammals evolved a new type of jaw where there's only a single bone in the lower jaw, and that bone houses a bunch of different types of teeth, canines and incisors and molar teeth like the ones we have. So mammals have this new type of jaw, and the bones that used to be at the back of the jaw of their ancestors moved into the ear and helped to conduct sound and help these first mammals hear even better than the other animals at the time. It's those suite of changes to the jaws, the teeth, and to the ears that for hundreds of years, anatomists and paleontologists have considered to be the hallmark of true mammals. So these first true mammals with those features lived in the Triassic alongside dinosaurs. They probably evolved those things in order to endure in a world where dinosaurs were thriving. Now, these first mammals, they were not very impressive. I hate to say, I love these fossils, but they were not the spectacular creatures of prehistory that inspire us. They were small little things that if you saw them, you would probably think they were little mice or rats, tiny little things, and they would have looked like this. And down below is a jawbone of one of these very first mammals. It's from Britain. And that's a grain of rice next to it for scale. That shows how small the first mammals were. So they might not have looked very impressive, but believe me, they were. Because by evolving that new type of jaw, this more sophisticated way of hearing, these new teeth, and adding that to other things they were developing, milk to feed their babies, bigger brains, these things were superpowers that allowed mammals to survive in the shadows of the dinosaurs. And we actually have some fossils of these mammals that lived with the dinosaurs in Scotland, where I live and where I work, where I teach at the University of Edinburgh. The fossils are found at a beautiful place, one of my favorite places in the world. And I was just there about a week ago looking for fossils. And this is the Isle of Skye. And maybe some, of you, maybe some of you have been there, but maybe some of you have seen this on television or in National Geographic. Beautiful. So big Hollywood blockbusters they've been filming on Sky because of the incredible scenery of this island. But for paleontologists, we love Sky not only because it's beautiful, but because a lot of those rocks that carve the cliffs of Sky are made up of rock from the Jurassic period, the next time after the Triassic when both dinosaurs and mammals are evolving. And we do field work in Sky all the time. Uh, our students always find the most amazing fossils. If any of you saw my talks this morning that, that we did, the kids' talks about dinosaurs, I gave the story of Amelia, one of our students in the middle there, who found this beautiful skeleton of a pterodactyl a few years ago on Sky. I wish I could say I found it, but no, it was one of our students. And that's, as we're seeing here in Bulgaria as well, often students make the best fossil discoveries. And that's something to remember for all the younger people out there. But we bring our, our students to Sky every year. We look for the big stuff like dinosaurs and pterodactyls, but we look for mammals too. And we have to scrutinize the rock and look with tiny you know, hand lenses and magnifying glasses to look for these little mammal fossils. You can find them. They're very rare. And in fact, in the 1970s, somebody, even long before dinosaurs were found on the Isle of Skye, somebody found this thing, which looks like a bit of 
roadkill or something, but it's actually the skeleton of a little mammal from that time. This was the, one of the first ever found in the world, a skeleton of one of those tiny mammals living with the dinosaurs, because they're so small and so delicate. So for a long time, paleontologists knew there were mammals living with dinosaurs, but mostly the fossils were just teeth and jawbones, not much else. This told us there was more out there to be found, but still they remained rare until the 1990s, when farmers in China working their land in northeastern China, a place called Liaoning Province, a land of rolling hills and fields and factories, farmers started to find some amazing things. Now, some of those farmers found dinosaurs with feathers on them. And those are the famous feathered dinosaurs that really prove today's birds evolved from dinosaurs. That's the story I'll tell in my next book, by the way, which I've just started to write, which is all about birds. But anyway, hopefully I'll be back in three or four years to talk about that. But alongside those dinosaurs with feathers, these farmers found lots of little mammal skeletons, most of them no bigger than a mouse, but with all the bones preserved, and even a lot of times hair preserved on these fossils. These skeletons tell us something very important. They tell us that although the mammals living with the dinosaurs were small, they were very successful. Don't think just because they were small that they were not important, that they were boring that they were an evolutionary failure. No, not the case. These mammals were small, but they were incredibly diverse. Some of them were climbers. Some were diggers. Some were swimmers. Some even had wings of skin that they used to glide between the trees. And the very biggest ones of all, which were just about the size of a cat, a house cat, were ones like this, they were predators. And this one is called Repenomamus. And it was found with its last meal in its stomach. The last food it ate before it died was found fossilized in its belly. And that last food, that last meal, was a baby dinosaur. So these mammals ate dinosaurs. So the point is that during the age of dinosaurs, the dinosaurs went big. The dinosaurs kept the mammals small, but the mammals were so good at being small, they actually did the opposite. They kept the dinosaurs big. And what I mean by that is, you never ever saw a T-Rex the size of a mouse or a Triceratops the size of a rat because it was mammals that held those roles in the ecosystems. And that's how things stood. For about 150 million years, there was something of an evolutionary truce, <laughs> an equilibrium. The dinosaurs were the big ones. The mammals were the tiny ones. And they lived alongside each other for so long. But then, 66 million years ago, one Saturday afternoon, let's say, in the spring, it was supposedly in the spring, this 10-kilometer wide rock was hurtling through the heavens. It was an asteroid. It could have gone anywhere. It was a piece of space junk. But it just so happened to make a direct hit right on the Earth. And it was traveling like 10 times faster than a speeding bullet. It was bigger than any asteroid that had approached the Earth in at least the last half a billion years. And it smacked right into the Earth with the force of over a billion nuclear bombs put together. And it punched a hole in the Earth more than 150 kilometers wide. That's a crater, and you can see some of it today in Mexico that still survives. And this unleashed catastrophe, earthquakes, wildfires, tsunamis, all the dust and dirt from the collision went into the atmosphere. It blocked out the sun. The earth went dark and cold for maybe up to 10 years. Plants didn't have sunlight to photosynthesize to make their food, so they died. Meat eaters didn't have the plant eater to eat. They died. Ecosystems collapsed like houses of cards. And the dinosaurs, except for a few birds, the dinosaurs couldn't deal with all of this sudden change. T. rex, triceratops, those dinosaurs were there, alive, thriving the day the asteroid hit. But they would not make it through. But, of course, there were some survivors. The dinosaurs, nope. The dinosaurs were part of 
a list of victims that included 75% of all living things. If you were alive then, you had a three out of four chance of going extinct. But you had a one out of four chance of surviving. And among those survivors were some furry little creatures that were really good at living in the shadows, living anonymously. They were adaptable. They were smart. And these were our mammal ancestors. And I think it bears repeating and thinking about that we, all of us here in this room, we had actual ancestors that stared down that asteroid and survived it. And now you can imagine you're one of those ancestors. <laughs> and the asteroid is come and gone. The earth starts to heal. And you look out and 75% of everything that was once there is now dead. The world is open. The opportunities are endless. Finally, now mammals were free from the dinosaurs and they could evolve in new ways. So a lot of my research recently in fieldwork has focused on New Mexico in the southwestern part of America. And New Mexico is one of those places where there's a lot of wide open spaces, a lot of rock carved into these badlands. That rock is full of fossils. Fossils of some of the last dinosaurs and fossils of some of those mammals that took over from the dinosaurs. And we do field work there every year. This is Sarah, who is my very first PhD student. And this is Tom, who is a dear friend and colleague of mine. In just a few weeks' time, we'll be going out to New Mexico again. Just at the end of this month, actually. It's really creeping up on us. So we'll be out there before the month is over. I'll be away from the Scottish rain, and yes, it's still raining and gray in Scotland. And I'll be in the desert of New Mexico looking for mammal fossils. And the fossils we find there tell the story of how mammals took over from the dinosaurs. What we see in New Mexico are lots and lots and lots of fossils of mammals. We can actually walk through the rocks we can find dinosaur bones. We actually find so many dinosaur bones that we can't help but walk it on the rubble of broken dinosaur bones. There's so many of them. And then the dinosaur bones abruptly stop. The asteroid, the extinction. And then in the rocks above, we start to find these kind of fossils, fossil mammals. And almost all of these mammal fossils, though, are of one special type of mammal, what we call placental mammals. And these are the ones like us that can give birth to big, well-developed babies that spend a lot of time in the womb. Now today, there are about 6,500 species of mammals. There's a few monotremes like the platypus that still lay eggs. These are primitive holdovers of those mammals that once lived with the dinosaurs. There are some marsupials like kangaroos and koalas that give birth to tiny little babies and raise those babies in pouches. But the vast majority of mammals today, about 95%, are placental mammals, including us, including my little boy there. <laughs> and it was placentals, placentals that took over from when the dinosaurs died. And all of these mammals here are placental mammals. Tigers, dolphins, elephants, bats, humans, were all placentals. Now, the more fossils we find in New Mexico, the more that we see how placentals were able to take over. And there's something really cool, there's some really neat research that some of my postdocs have been doing that we've been publishing recently. We did a study last year where we thought maybe it was big, the placentals had bigger brains than other mammals. And we CAT scanned a lot of fossil mammal skulls, and we used software to reconstruct the brain. And we actually came to this startling conclusion that no, these placentals were not particularly intelligent, the ones that took over from the dinosaurs. In fact, these placentals, their brains got smaller relative to their bodies because their bodies got so big so fast after the dinosaurs died. And it makes sense when you think about it. For 150 million years, mammals were small. They couldn't get bigger than a cat. The dinosaurs were putting pressure on them. Then the dinosaurs die. Now mammals, in a world free of T. rex and triceratops, can get big. And they did. 
In New Mexico, we see fossils of mammals the size of pigs just about 200,000 years after the asteroid. Remember, for 150 million years, mammals never got bigger than a cat. Now at 200,000 years out from the asteroid, you have mammals the size of pigs. A million years later, you have mammals the size of cows. So they got really big, really fast, so big that their brains couldn't even keep pace with their bodies and their brains shrunk in relative size. And those mammals actually got stupider for a while. It took about 10 million years for their brains to get bigger and to then keep getting bigger, leading to us today. So what we're seeing is it's big size that helped these mammals take over the world, not intelligence necessarily. So how did mammals get to be so big so fast? We think we have the answer. One of my postdocs also led, a, I should say my, it was my postdoc Ornella Bertrand who led the project on brain evolution. My postdoc Greg Funston led this cool study looking at the teeth of some of these mammals that lived right after the dinosaurs died. There are actually daily lines of growth in teeth kind of like the tree rings, but these lines are laid down every single day. It's true of our teeth up until a certain age as well. And by counting these lines and looking at how the chemistry changed across these lines, Greg was able to see that there were periods of time where these mammals had elevated zinc and barium in their teeth. And you say, okay, who cares? Well, it's actually a big deal because we know for modern day mammals, that there are two interval, there are two times in a mammal's life when those two chemicals change very quickly. And one is at birth, and the other is when a mammal stops drinking its mother's milk and starts getting its own food. So long story short, Greg was able to match those chemical signals to those lines and was able to tell that some of these mammals living right after the dinosaur extinction raised their babies in the womb for seven months which when you think about it is pretty crazy. Hardly any other animals do anything like that. This is the root of our long pregnancies as humans. So these babies were in the womb for seven months, then they were born at a pretty large size. And they fed on their mother's milk for about one month and then they started to get their own food. And so we think that by having longer pregnancies, that these baby mammals were able to get bigger inside the womb, inside the safety of the womb, then they could be born as bigger, better developed babies. That gave them a leg up and that allowed them to get really big really fast after the dinosaurs died. So that's the research we're working on right now. We've just published these things over the last year or so. We're continuing to do a lot of work. And who knows what we'll find in New Mexico next month. But the point of the story is, it is placental mammals that are the ones. Of all the mammals that have ever lived, it is these special mammals that can give birth to well-developed babies that were the ones that really took over from the dinosaurs. Now, for about 10 million years after the dinosaur extinction, there were lots of different placentals. But these were mostly deep ancestors of today's placentals. We don't really see obvious bats or whales or elephants or monkeys in the fossil record. We see their ancestors. But about 55 or 56 million years ago, that's when the modern day types of mammals that we are familiar with started to proliferate. And there's a very famous fossil site in Germany. And it's actually an old pit, an old quarry, where they mined oil shale. And that quarry closed down because it became unprofitable after the wars. And they almost turned that hole in the ground, this big ugly hole in the ground, into a landfill. They were going to dump all of the garbage from Frankfurt into this hole. But the locals stepped in and they stopped that from happening and instead, that big hole in the ground became a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Landfill <laughs> World Heritage Site. Why is that? It's not because it was a mine, it's because of the fact that in those rocks that had the oil, there are also fossils. A lot of fossils. Beautiful fossils of birds and snakes and frogs and all kinds of things, but especially of mammals. And these fossils, some of which you can see here, are some of the very oldest ones in the fossil record that obviously are horses and rodents and primates. 
So by 55 million years ago, we have the modern types of mammals starting to proliferate. And these are some of them here. So they are modern types, but they're still strange in their own ways. Those first horses were only the size of little poodle dogs, for instance. But they had to start somewhere. Now, pretty quickly, these mammals started to get bigger and bigger and evolve into new species. And during this interval of time, which is called the Eocene period, some of these mammals became really weird and really spectacular in their own ways. These are all different types of hoofed mammals that are now extinct that thrived during the Eocene, including the very biggest mammals that ever lived on land. And these were these rhinos that had no horns, but they had bodies that weighed like almost 20 tons. So you can see very quickly, once those modern groups of mammals evolved, they started to spin out all kinds of quirky, funky new types of mammals, many of which have gone extinct. But also during the Eocene, we start to see the first fossils of some really peculiar mammals that still survive today. Mammals that have developed really strange new ways of living and behaving, including bats. This is when we see the first fossil bats. And when you think about it, it's really an amazing thing. A mammal that turned its arms and hands into wings to fly. This was only the third time in the history of life that an animal with bones evolved proper powered flight. The others being pterodactyls and birds. And so we see the first bats in the Eocene. And almost immediately, bat fossils start turning up all over the world because bats evolved the ability to fly, that allowed them to disperse everywhere, and they became the first proper, truly global group of mammals. And of course, today, many, many, many bats, the vast majority of mammal species are bats. I know we don't see bats a lot of times, they're mostly active at night, but the, there, there are more bat species than any other type of mammal, and they live Every, almost everywhere around the world. Now, also during this time called the Eocene, starting about 55 million years ago, another group of mammals started to do something spectacular in its own way. They started to change their bones and their bodies to have a different lifestyle. And these mammals were ones like this. And maybe if you look at this one, Maybe it looks kind of like a wolf or something. You see it has a long snout, it has sharp teeth, you know, up here. But if you look at those hands and feet, they kind of look like flippers, like something you'd wear scuba diving. And that's because this animal used them to move in the water. What you are looking at here is one of the very first whales. Whales evolved from mammals that lived on land. They actually evolved from mammals that had hooves and ran on the land. And they changed those hooves into flippers, and they moved into the water. And in doing so, they completely refashioned their bodies into swimming machines. And there is a beautiful sequence of fossils that document that transition. This is one of the best understood major evolutionary transitions. When one type of animal, an animal with hooves for running on the land, changes into something else. An animal with a body that looks like a submarine with flippers for swimming in the water. And we have fossils that document all these different steps. One of the best examples of evolution preserved in the fossil record. And some of these fossils are just stunning. There's a place in Egypt called Wadi al Atan, the Valley of the Whales. And there, not too far from the Great Pyramids, you can actually go out and see these skeletons of Eocene aged whales eroding out of the desert, which I think is absolutely stunning. And crazy, this is the desert. <laughs> it's like seeing these whales, you know, plonked on the craters of the moon. It makes no sense. But it makes sense when you think about history because during that time, the Sahara Desert was actually covered by water and there were whales living there. So an absolutely amazing, amazing place. And I should say a lot of the research, they're funded by National Geographic. We have our friends from National Geographic here. Well, I should also say you guys funded our field work in Scotland. I don't know why I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so 
If any of you ever go to Egypt, you can go there. You can take tours and you can go out and you can see these fossils. Of course, these whales would continue to evolve and diversify, leading to today's whales. And today, there are still whales with us. Those whales are the very biggest creatures on the planet today. And in fact, the blue whale is the biggest mammal that has ever lived. And not only that, it's the biggest animal that has ever lived, ever, in the entire history of the earth. Four and a half billion years of earth history. This is the biggest thing that's ever lived. It is alive right now. We share the planet with it. I think that is a magical thing to think about. The biggest thing ever lives right now. But endangered, quite close to extinction, if we're not careful. And I think that would be a tragedy. And I think you can imagine an alternative world where whales have gone extinct and all that remains are their giant petrified bones. And if that was the case, I think we would hold whales in the same esteem that we hold dinosaurs. But thankfully, whales are still with us, so let's keep it this way. So, bats, whales, all these other groups of mammals are evolving in the Eocene. The Eocene then transitions into the next interval of time called the Oligocene. The continents are continuing to move around. By this point, the world is starting to look really familiar to us, and the climate is also changing too. Now, in this world, there are a few continents that were island continents. Now, today, Australia is an island continent. It's out there by itself. But in, during the Eocene and the Oligocene, South America and Africa were also island continents. They were not connected to any of the other continents. And during that time, they evolved their own peculiar mammals that lived only there. On Africa, the elephants evolved. They are an African native stock of mammals that later on spread around the world. But they incubated on Africa, when Africa was an island. In South America, there were a whole bunch of weird animals. It was only two and a half million years ago that South America connected with North America. And the mammals changed. They... Darwin himself, on the Beagle, when he was sailing around the world, he found fossils of some South American mammals that made no sense to him. He couldn't identify them. They seemed like they were a weird combination, a little bit of elephant, a little bit of rodent, a little bit of horse. He didn't know what to make of these things. He wrote about them in The Origin of Species. In fact, in the very first paragraph of The Origin of Species, Darwin didn't talk about the finches or the Galapagos. No, no. He led with these weird mammals from South America. Nobody knew what these things were until within the last decade, somebody found some proteins and some DNA in some of their ancient bones and were able to tell that these are actually close relatives of horses and rhinos. They're basically a long lost tribe of horses that somehow found their way to South America. Once they got there, they were isolated for tens of millions of years and they evolved into their own weird forms. Incredible. And I think Darwin himself would be very proud of that DNA evidence that's come to light. Now, as these mammals are evolving, the climate is changing. During the Eocene, it was really a continuation of the dinosaur age. The world was hot. There were big jungles across much of the planet. But as the Eocene changed into the Oligocene, the climate around the world started to get colder. And that had to do with changes in the ocean currents, changes in the position of the land masses. And so a lot of those jungles turned into more open ecosystems because the big trees couldn't grow so easily across much of the world. Instead, it was smaller plants that could grow quickly and could survive drought and could survive times of cold. And among these plants were grasses. And this was the first time in Earth history, just about 20 million years ago, that grasses spread across the land. To us, grasses are so normal. But a brontosaurus would have never seen a blade of grass. Even those very first mammals that survived the asteroid wouldn't have really known what grass was. It was only about 20 million years ago that grasslands began to spread as the global climate got cooler. And mammals had to adapt. And new mammals evolved to live in these new environments. And these are some very famous fossil mammals that you can see in America. You can go to a place called Nebraska in the middle of the country, 
And you can go to a site where about 12 million years ago, a volcano, actually the same volcano that's still active at Yellowstone today, that volcano erupted and it buried a bunch of mammals and turned them into fossils. And the mammals it turned into fossils were not like the mammals we know from North America today. There were rhinos, there were horses, there were camels. Basically, 12 million years ago, you could have gone on safari in the middle of America, as crazy as that sounds. And it was these mammals adapting to the new grasslands. Now, that's uh, what was happening in the grasslands with the big plant-eating mammals. But, of course, then meat-eaters had to adapt to the new prey. And this is where we start to see the first ancestors of dogs and cats, proper modern dogs and cats, evolving on those grasslands. But that's what's happening in North America. It was also happening in Europe and in Asia. There's some very, very famous fossils of early horses and, and the associated fauna from here in Bulgaria that some of the scientists of the museum are world experts in studying. But other parts of the world were a little bit different. Australia, more so than any other, and I mentioned Australia was and still is an island continent all off by its own. Well, there are some famous fossils of that same time period from Australia, the same time when those camels and rhinos are in North America. This is at a place called Riverslee. And these fossils are not of camels and rhinos. They're not of dogs and cats. They are of completely different mammals, mammals we've almost forgotten about, mammals that I just barely mentioned. They are marsupial mammals, the ones that raise their little babies in pouches. Now, it just so happens there were a lot of marsupials that were alive with the dinosaurs. And many of them died out when the asteroid hit. We don't know why, but they did. A few of them survived, and they basically escaped down to South America and Australia. And there, they evolved in isolation, separated from the rest of the mammals of the world. And that's why you still see a lot of marsupials in South America and Australia today, but you don't see them, say, here in Europe. And there were all kinds of amazing marsupials, including the ancestors of koalas and kangaroos and wombats that are seen as fossils in Australia. And the big meat-eaters were marsupials too. There were marsupial versions of lions and tigers that evolved totally independently of proper lions and tigers. Now, the climate then continued to change. And as time ticked towards the modern, the world got even colder. And about two and a half million years ago, the world went into a proper deep freeze, an ice age. And not only an ice age, but the ice age, the one that we always talk about. And really what the ice age was, was that that ice cap at the North Pole, it grew so big that it extended down deep into the continents of North America and Europe and Asia. It didn't quite get down this far, but for where I'm from in the middle part of America, it did. In Edinburgh in Scotland, where I live and teach now, would have been covered by a mile thickness of ice up to 10,000 years ago, which is incredible to think about. So the world got cold, ice expanded over much of the north, and the world really would have looked like this if you were in North America, Europe, or Asia near the ice sheets. And of course, mammals had to adapt, and they did. And this is when some of the most famous mammals of all lived. The megafauna, the woolly mammoths, the saber-toothed tigers. They were Ice Age animals adapted to that harsh world. But there were more. It wasn't just mammoths and saber-toothed tigers. There were giant armadillos the size of Volkswagens. There were woolly rhinoceroses. There were American lions. There were deer with antlers the size of a dinner table. There were sloths that lived on the ground, not in the trees, and those sloths were 10 feet tall. And I can go on and on. The Ice Age was a time of incredible animals, some of the most famous animals of all, but almost all of them are now extinct. They died out about 10,000 years ago. And they died out right around the same time a new type of mammal was spreading around the world. And that new type of mammal encountered the megafauna, encountered woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers, hunted them, drew their pictures on cave walls. And of course, the mammal I'm talking about is us, humans. Now, the very first humans were ones like these, 
that lived starting about five or six million years ago in Africa. And they were apes that came down from the trees and started to walk upright only on their legs. And then after they started to walk upright, their hands were freed for other things. They could make tools to help with hunting. And that probably led to their brains getting a lot bigger. And then only about 300,000 years ago or so, a new type of human came onto the scene, and that was our species, Homo sapiens. Now, when our species evolved in Africa, it stayed in Africa for a while, but of course, like most mammals, it started to migrate, it started to wander. And as it left Africa and went into Europe and into Asia, it did not find open virgin territory, no. It would have encountered other species of humans that had already evolved in Africa and already migrated out, including Neanderthals here in Europe. So our species, Homo sapiens, really is only the last of a long line of other humans. And up until the Neanderthals went extinct about 40,000 years ago, there were always multiple species of humans living together. So right now is a really peculiar time in human history when there's only one species left alone to ponder where we came from. And of course, we wander and we've now gone to outer space, and who knows how far we will wander beyond. But as we are wandering, on our planet at least, we are putting a lot of pressure on other mammals. And right now is the most perilous time in the history of mammals since our ancestors experienced that asteroid. Since humans started to spread around the world, about three or four hundred species of mammals have gone extinct. That's about five percent of all mammals. Now maybe that number seems small to you, maybe it seems big to you. But the point is that as we are spreading, we are putting pressure on other mammals. And so many mammals are endangered today. So that's why I think this story is important, to understand where we came from, how we are but one of many thousands of mammals in today's world, probably one of many millions of mammals that have lived over time, and we have an incredibly rich history that goes back 325 million years to those coal swamps and those very first animals that evolved that hole in their head. So we would be wise to preserve that legacy. So thank you very much. I'm very happy to take some questions. Uh, Mr. Professor, thank you for a wonderful uh, lecture. You gathered everyone here to hear you. And uh, I hope you have uh, additional uh, scientific experience with Vlado and uh, the mm. team here in mm -hmm. Bulgaria. Uh, I want to ask you the question. Mm. <laughs> why did the megafauna extinct? Oh, why did the megafauna die, the mammoths and saber tooths? Well, they died out about 10,000 years ago. The, the last ones died, the last mammoths and saber tooths and many other species. Now, this was when the Ice Age was ending, or at least the last glacial cycle of the Ice Age was ending. So there were big climate changes happening then, but this was also the time when humans were really spreading around the world properly. And we do know that our ancestors did hunt a lot of the megafauna. We have fossils of mammoths and sloths and other things with the marks from human tools. So I really do think uh, that, uh, that humans are the main reason why those animals died, with the climate as well. And I think it was probably the fact that humans were spreading while the climate was changing so quickly. Now, there's still a lot of argument about that. It's nowhere near as accepted as the asteroid theory for the dinosaurs. You still see a lot of new research about the megafauna extinction. But when it comes down to it, everything I've read, everything I've learned, makes me think of just one simple thing. If there were no humans, a lot of that megafauna would probably still be here. What is your opinion on, the, on if humanity will leave a very, very deep uh, scar on the very geolog geological history of the planet. Do you think that humanity, when, it, when it's rapidly developing technologies, would eventually uh, you know, come to be regarded as a changer of the uh, very geology and the very, very history of Earth for, by a future civilization? Or do you think that it would be hard for a future civilization of theoretical non-humans to detect our presence 
Yeah. In general, yeah, that's that's a of, that's a fun question, isn't it? And I mean, I'm sure you guys have your opinions too. Um, it's fun to think about because you know, if something happened and humans went extinct, uh, there was another asteroid or nuclear war or something. I mean, would a hundred million years from now, would it, uh, uh, the the paleontologists of that time, the, the the cockroaches that survived and became paleontologists, would they be able to tell there was this humanity? that evolved high intelligence and, and built civilizations, or not. Um, and this also goes into this idea of the Anthropocene, which maybe you know, some of you have heard that term, this idea that maybe humans have caused there to be a new geological time interval now, that humans have changed the Earth so much that we should actually have a new uh, space on the geological time scale for the modern time, the Anthropocene. My thoughts are that certainly humans will leave a record. I mean, there, there are fossil humans that we find of our ancestors. Probably none of us will fossilize because the odds of turning into a fossil are really slim. But maybe, hey, somebody in this room might turn into a fossil. There's bound to be fossils of humans. But whether our cities and roads and all the things we built, whether they survive in the rock record, I don't no, you know, as a geologist, what I do know is that erosion is very powerful. The earth is constantly being reshaped. And so my suspicion is that we might leave a chemical signal in the rock record, maybe something with plastics, maybe something with radionucleotides, something that future geochemists could determine. We'll probably leave some weird artifacts, but probably if we were to go extinct, say, soon, which I don't think we will, <laughs> I think we would be more of a line in the fossil record, more of an event, kind of like the iridium that marks the end of the time of dinosaurs. That's my suspicion. But ultimately, I don't know. And that's a fun one to talk about over maybe some beers or some Rikea. Maybe not too much Rikea. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the uh, very interesting lecture. Uh, my name is Dmitry. Uh, I would like to ask uh, such a question. Uh, so, uh, for me, it's more, more or less clear what happened with the dinosaurs uh, 66, mm -hmm. 66 million years ago um, on the land, but also we know that the dinosaurs were living in the water. And what was the situation in the water? Why they disappeared? Mm -hmm. Because uh, we know that, uh, for, the, for example, sharks and other big creatures, fishes, they survive uh, this... Um, uh, this problem somehow, but what, what, why were the dinosaurs only uh, the species that uh, like it, it disappeared from all the chains uh, in the in the nature? How it happens? Yes, so that's a great question. So you know, when the asteroid hit, like up until that time, you know, there were all these dinosaurs living on the land. They were the dominant animals on land. In the water, the dominant animals were other types of reptiles that were cousins of the dinosaurs. Things like plesiosaurs and mosasaurs, and a little bit earlier on, ichthyosaurs. There were all these different reptiles living in the water. Um, when the asteroid hit, it caused a big extinction on land and in the water. There's huge extinctions in the ocean, too. And that's because the food web on land and in the ocean ultimately has photosynthesis at its base. On land, it's plants that are photosynthesizing, turning sunlight into food. In the ocean, it's phytoplankton that are doing that. When the Earth went dark and cold during that long nuclear winter after the asteroid hit, the plants collapsed and the phytoplankton collapsed. So the ecosystems on land and sea both fell apart. And that put pressure on everything in the ecosystems. The, the ecosystems that were most resilient, most robust, were ones that were in rivers and lakes and ponds and swamps because those ecosystems have what we call detritus at the base of the food chain, so basically decaying organic matter, dead stuff. And that would have been a great time to be in an ecosystem where it's, that's based on a bunch of dead stuff. So the long story short is photosynthesis shut down in the oceans too and those food webs collapsed. And then modern day sharks and then later whales emerged to fill that vacuum left by the reptiles that went extinct. Where does the branch of Smilodon fit in the carnivore? Uh, oh, that's part such a of good question. The <laughs> fam 
part That's of a great question. So Smilodon is, you know, a saber-toothed tiger. It's the famous one. There were other saber-toothed tigers. Uh, we call them saber-toothed tigers, but they weren't actually tigers. They were like a separate family of cats. So they are cats. They're part of what we call the, you know, felid family, most saber-tooths. But there were some other carnivorous mammals closely related to cats that were not true cats that also evolved big saber teeth. So it's quite confusing. And that's where my knowledge ends because the dirty secret, of course, and some of you know this very well, I'm really a dinosaur specialist. I can tell you quite a lot about the dinosaur family tree. When it comes to mammals, I had to learn a lot of the details to write the book. And I read all of these papers about the uh, Smilodons and stuff. And I don't remember all the details. So you might know some of them better than me. I don't know. I just know that they're definitely not real tigers, though. Thank you, everybody. You've really been a great. Thank <laughs> you.